it gives me great honor to welcome and introduce Professor Si Wei Chen. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very glad to return to UCLA. And I still remember my days 20, 25 years ago, more than 25 years ago here. I learned quite a lot from UCLA, from the Graduate School of Management. And I'm, I'm very glad I can implement what I have learned here in China and to get a little achievement. Uh, and first, I would make two announcements. One is uh, after 10 years service in the National People's Congress, I retired last uh, in March last year. So uh, according to our constitution, we only can serve two terms, five years per term. So I no longer speak on behalf of the National People's Congress, just as a scholar. And the secondly, although I have many hats, I prefer the hats of professor because politicians come and go, and the professors will last much longer. So please call me professor. Okay. And today I'm going to talk about the, uh, the trade relationship between China and the United States. As you know, after the establishment of normal, democratic, uh, normal diplomatic uh, relationship 30 years ago between our our two countries, uh, the trade between our two countries is growing very fast. And today, China and the United States each other, are each other's second large partner, trade partner. I think the total trade between our two countries is over 300 billion US dollars. So first, uh, raise the question, why it can grow so fast? My answer is three points. First is you are in the higher end in the market, and we are on the lower end of the market, so we can mutually complementary. You know, the, uh, it, we produce the products in the lower market end, and the you, pro, you sell to us the product on the higher end. The first reason. The second reason is you are on the expanding side, and we are on the saving side. That means in the United States, the people borrow tomorrow's money to spend today. And in China, we save today's money for tomorrow. So that's the difference. I think this is because, this is because the consumerism culture. Actually, if you look at the history in the United States, uh, Benjamin Franklin said, no, he that going to Borrowing is going to sorrowing by that time, that was many years, years ago. And then now, and after the Second World War, I think it, the consumerism philosophy is said, buy now and pay later. So you borrow tomorrow's money to spend today. So and in this case, you know, we lend quite a lot of money to, to the American people and they can buy more things. So as you know, we bought the American governmental bond around eight, 800 billion US dollars, almost the, the same as the stimulus package, seven, 187 billion US dollars recently. Right. And uh, so this is uh, the second one. The third one is you have the, the technology and we have the qualified labor. And uh, I think 
as you know, the technology in the United States are very advanced. But if you produce the products here, the cost will be high, much higher than produce it in China. And in China, we have the qualified labor and much more, much less expensive. Uh, I talked to a, in Davos, a journalist come, came to me and put a question to me. I don't want to mention his nationality. And he said, your Chinese took out all our business. I said, uh, I'm sorry for that, but I just tell you, in the United States, hourly rate is 16, according to the Financial Times, in the United States, hourly rate for a worker, averagely, $16. In Mexico, $4. In China, 50 cents. If you are an investor, where would you like to invest? He smiled and said, China. So that's because, you know, the, the real estate cost, labor cost, and on the other hand, the, in, in China, we have the qualified labor. You know, Chinese people are diligent and they are willing to learn so they can master the new tech, new, the new tech uh, fast, very fast. Certainly, what I'm saying here is, although Chinese, Chinese workers only have a 50 cents per hour, but that not means Chinese workers' life is one thirty second uh, comparing with the American workers because, you know, the RMB has a much stronger purchasing power than the dollars, not only as the exchange rate. So I I just teasing my American friends. I think the best way is you work in Beijing and get paid from the United States. You will live a much better life. Right. So I think these three facts means the trade between China and the United States are mutually complementary. So that's why our trade can grow so fast. Certainly. Then we can raise a question, the trade imbalance. You know, that means the China has a large surplus in the trade. So there, how can we analyze this, this problem? My answer is first, there are some differences in statistics because according to our statistics, the trade surplus, surplus is much less than according to the statistics of the United States. I think there are several reasons. One reason is they, in the statistics of the United States, they take all the exports from Hong Kong to the United States as exports from China. But it's not, it's not true because the Hong Kong people, they have some kind of uh, their profit, right? I think it's almost uh, 20 to 25 percent, percent, you know, so they import from China and they export to the United States. There is a difference. You cannot count this credit to, count this to us. And the second is, if you count in this way, so how about the uh, American products sell to Japan or South Korea and then through them to sell to China? We didn't count for, for that. So this is, I think it's in the statistics, there are some uh, differences. Second is, I think, if you want to make the trade to be balanced, you have to sell more products to us. But now, because the restrictions for some high-tech uh, products, we cannot make the trade 
more balanced. I, I just uh, teasing my American friends. I said, if you can say, if you can sell a space shuttle to us, the balance will be much, will be, the trade balance will be, will be improved quite a lot, but you won't, right? So, so that means we need to find more things to, to buy from the United States. And recently we sent a delegation to the United States. Uh, we want to buy more, to buy more. We don't have no intention to persuade a high sub trade surplus. We would like to make the trade more balanced, be more balanced. But it need the effort from both sides. Third is, I wish we don't, it should not be politicized, the trade problem, that it's the deficit problem for the United States side. I heard a American congressman said, you see, all ships comes, come from China are fully loaded, and all ships go to China are empty. So how serious the trade imbalance is? My answer is nothing surprising, because what we sell to, to you is shoes, toys, clothes, they have to be shipped by vessels. But on the other hand, what you sell to us is high-tech products, chips, and so on. They will ship by air cargo. So that's why <laughs> that's the reason. And furthermore, is in the statics, they, you didn't count the service industry. Actually, in the service industry, the American side have the surplus. I think last year the surplus is, a, is a 16 billion US dollars. And the service industry, as you know, mo mostly carried by people, by talented people. So I think today no one take a ship from the United States to China, right? They all take the, the United Airlines or other airlines. So that's so don't politicize the, the trade issue. And the fourth is, I think we need to reconsider it, how to, uh, how to improve the industrial structure in the United States. I visited the Greenville, South Carolina, uh, I think in 2005. As you know, Greenville was a textile, sent textile base in the United States. Actually, I really saw some textile plants were closed, people were unemployed. But you cannot just blame China because textile industry, generally speaking, is a sunset industry in the United States because the cost is much higher. And then e even you don't buy China's products, can your textile industry compete with Mexican, with, uh, with uh, the, the Asian countries, with Vietnam or other countries? You can't. So in this case, you have to change your industrial structure. I talked to the Green Wheel people. They, they agree with me. Actually, they are doing this. They built, the GE built a turbine plant there. And all the orders of the turbine came from China. Right? So, that, so they can hire the people laid off by the textile uh, factories to the GE plant. And also, they built an automobile plant there, and so they can also, the Goodyear Tire also built a plant there. And also, we are talking about invest there to build a global industry park. So that means if you stick on the sunset industry in the United States, you cannot compete not only with China, but with other developing countries. 
So I think this is a very important issue for this. So in this case, I think we have to make the bilateral trade in a win-win result and also mutually beneficial. So as our Minister of Commerce, Mr. Chen Demin, published a paper in the uh, in your newspaper, I think you know, in the in the Washington uh, Post, as in your newspaper said, you know, in this case, facing the financial crisis, we need to cooperate more closer, and uh, we need to improve our trade structure and to reduce the trade imbalance through the common efforts from both sides. And the third, we need to continue to dialogue, to communicate, because if there will be no winner in a trade war, I think we need, what we need is to dialogue, is to seek for the solution, to, to the reasonable solution, instead of a trade war. So, generally speaking, I think the future of the trade between China and the United States is very bright. As I said, one is the relation, the trade is mutually complementary. And uh, secondly, is because China has a much has a very strong potential in the future. First is China is, uh, has uh, the social stability. You can see in China, we are developing and the prerequisite is to keep the social stability. And the second is China is, has a huge potential in the, as the market. I visit uh, Atlanta and uh, I said, if one Chinese drink one bottle of Coca-Cola, the, the market will be 1.3 billion can bottle Coca-Cola. So the, the market potential is, is very huge. The third is China is uh, developing quite fast. That will bring much more business opportunity to the American businessman. As you know, the export from China to the Western world, 70% are produced in the, in the joint venture, uh, in the joint venture. And uh, about uh, two thirds are from the they have some American investments. So the, there are many opportunities for the foreign investors. And uh, fourth, I think the investment environment is improving in China. As you know, according to our promise to the WTO, we revised our legal system, some laws to accommodate to the, uh, to the WTO principle. And on the, on the other hand, we invest quite a lot in infrastructure in China. And uh, at this time being, we are the second largest uh, highway, we have the second largest highway mileage in China. I think the United States is around 80,000 kilometers. And in China now it's close to 50,000 kilometers high, highway. And, the, and also the internet service is improved quite a lot. If you come to China, you can compare the internet service in China. And also the mobile phone users is 600 million. We have 600 million mobile phone users. So 
So this is, you know, in flush. We that means we are improving our in, infrastructures. So the investment environment is improving quite fast. From what I heard, the the investment environment is not so favorable in the United States to the Chinese investors comparing with what we gave to the American investors, from what I heard. And finally, as I said, we have a less expensive and highly qualified labor. So I think this makes China has a competitive advantage in the trade. And on the other hand, I think the United States, as the largest developed countries, they have also have many advantages. I think the creativity is a very important point in the United States. I think you're, you have many advanced technologies and you have a very new idea, many new ideas and uh, creative thinking. And, on that, and the second is the human resources. You have high talented internationalized labor, the, the, the people. So that's also very important. And the third is you have a highly developed the, the, the uh, financial system, but now I think they are under critic. But certainly, I think some of them have to be improved. But in general speaking, your financial system still has some, uh, some good things, not all bad. So I think in this case, the trade between China and the United States will have a bright future. This is the second point. The third point I would like to talk is about what's the most uh, promising field in the future in, uh, in the trade between our two countries. I, my, in my opinion, new energy is the most uh, promising future in our bilateral trade. Actually, uh, before President Obama took took over the, the presidency, two think tanks are working on this issue. One is uh, the Brookings Institute, the other is Asian Society. Both of them came to me to ask my advice, and we had a very good discussion about this. I think the new energy can kill three birds with one stone. Why I say that? First, if we develop the new energy, like wind energy, like uh, uh, solar energy, and uh, biofuels and others, we can lessen the pressure of petroleum, of the energy crisis. As you know, the United States import quite a lot of uh, petroleum. And uh, China is also became a net importer of petroleum. And uh, the petroleum prices, you know, is fluctuated dramatically. Nobody can uh, predict what's the price tomorrow. Actually, the highest over around 150 and the lowest uh, maybe around 20 to 30 dollars. So that means we cannot rely only on petroleum. We have to find some way at, at least to release our reliance on petroleum. So I think new energy has this very important role. And the second is about the climate change. As you know, the climate change is becoming a more important issue. 
in my opinion, the climate change is much more important than the financial crisis from a long-range point of view because it's related to, this, to our existence and the future development in this planet. So by developing new energy, we can solve the problem of the climate change. And the third, as you know, the food crisis is also very criti critical. And although at this time being, we made the biofuel from you know, corns, and I think in the future, we can make the biofuel with the cellulose or semi-cellulose. So that means we can have a renewable energy resources. And as long as the sun exists, we will have the renewable uh, energy resource through uh, in the earth. So that's why I said the new energy can kill three birds with one stone to solve the energy prices, the climate change, and also the food crisis. <coughs> so I think this will be a bright future for in the cooperation between our two countries. And the last, I would like to introduce a little about the situation in China. Uh, I, I think I made a video speech, uh, I think maybe one month or two months ago, on the, the China's economy. So today I just uh, brief you uh, very shortly. As you know, China enjoys a fast growth rate in the last 30 years. Average is 9%. And since uh, the year 2003, uh, we enjoy a two-digit uh, growth rate. Uh, 2003, 10%. 2004, 10.1. 2005, 10.4. 2006, 11.4. 2007, 13%. So that's, we enjoy the, the high two-digit growth rate in the, between 2003 to 2007. And according to my research, the economic cycle for China is around 10 years. So 2007 will be the peak. And the 2008 dropped to 9%. And if you look quarterly, this situation is more serious. In the fourth quarter of 2007, it was 11%. First quarter of 2008 is 10.4%, uh, 10.6%, 10.4%, and the second quarter is 10.1%, and the third quarter was 9%, fourth quarter was 6.8%. That means from starting from the third quarter last year, the Chinese growth rate dropped very rapidly. And the first quarter is 6.1%. That means the, the dropping rate is, uh, slow, is slowing down. But we still have a serious problem. Because according to my anal analysis, the 6.1% is not because, not mainly because the stimulated package, package of the four uh, billion, uh, the, the, of the four trading stimulated package. If you anal analyze the driving forces in China's economy, there are three. One is investment, second is cons consumption, third is net export. And in the year 2007, when we enjoy the 30% growth rate, 
the contribution of investment is 39%. Consumption is 38%. Net export was 23%. And in the first quarter of this year, we got a set 6.1% uh, growth rate. But the four point, you know, among the 6.1%, 4.3% were contributed by, was contributed by consumption. And 2% was contributed by investment. And the net export contributed minus 0.2%. So that means in the first quarter, we can keep a 6.1 growth rate is mainly by consumption, not by investment. And the contribution for net profit is minus. So that gives us a lesson is because we have the spring festival in the first quarter. And the spring Chinese people spend quite a lot in the spring festival. And on the other hand, the government, local central government and local government uh, put many policies like subsidize the, uh, uh, the electric appliance to the peasants, to the people in the urban area, subsidize them so they can buy more electric appliance. And on the other hand, some local government issued quite a lot subsidiary coupons to the people to stimulate the consumption so that we can keep a relatively high growth rate. And the stimulus package, I think it will take some time to show its effect. So in my opinion, the second quarter maybe will be the bottom of China's economy. And the second half of this year will be better than the first half. And next year will be better than this year. And by the year 2011, I think we can reach a normal economic growth and open a new economic cycle in China. So that's my prediction. So to summarize my points is, one is the trade between China and the United States are mutually complementary. So they will have a bright future. And the second is we should deal with, we should deal with the trade deficit issues carefully and to solve the problem through the mutual effort from both sides. And the third is the trade between China and the United States will have a bright future because of both sides have its competitive advantages. And the fourth is, I think, the, the, new, the, new, the new area in the trade is new energy. And, uh, Although now we are facing the financial crisis, but just as the English poet, poet Shirley said, if winter comes, can spring be far behind? I think sooner or later the crisis will be over. We should look one more step ahead. The post, what should we do in the post-crisis? I think we will promote the cooperation between our two countries and to get a win-win situation in the future. Because the United States as the largest exporter and the trader, international trader, United States is the largest international trader and China is the third largest international trader. We have to cooperate to to make the world a, a better place for us. And also, the United States is the largest developed country, and China is the largest developed country. So the relationship between our two countries is not 
only important for for the Chinese people and American people, but also very important in the world peace and development in the future. So I'm just uh, take this opportunity to express some of my thoughts to you. And now I will open for the questions. Thank you very much. Professor Chen, I, I wonder whether you could comment on uh, the prospects for reducing foreign direct investment restrictions. Oh. You, you refer to joint ventures, but as you know, particularly American multinational companies are somewhat hesitant okay. and would prefer, of course, to have wholly owned subsidiaries rather than joint ventures with Chinese companies. Okay. Uh, actually, you know, the FDI is very important to China's uh, development. Uh, cumulatively, I think the FDI to China is over six, uh, over 800 billion total. And uh, the FDI from China to abroad is around 100 billion. So the FDI is very important to China's development. And each year we have around 50 billion to 80 billion FDI flow in to China. But uh, as you know, at this time being, M and A in the FDI is over 70%. So in China, we also have to accommodate this trend because at this time being the grassroots plants is, I think, is sometimes is uh, obsolete because, you know, the capacity, we have some overcapacity of the products. So what we need is not to produce more products to build a new plant for, from, to produce more products. We need, what we need to do is to raise the, the value of the, of the enterprises. So that means we need more. In the future, M and A will be the main trend. So in this case, I think we need, uh, in China we have now, uh, we, publish, we have now published some regulations for the M&A. Generally speaking, we encourage the M&A in China, uh, but certainly we have some kind of uh, procedures and uh, we have uh, the antitrust law. We have to, uh, to do some uh, reviews of the big, uh, large M&A projects. And uh, I think also we are encouraging our companies to go out to, to do M&A abroad, including to the United States. Establish Chinese National Bank and give credit with UAM you in mean, Los Angeles. You mean the same than in Jamaica. Oh, oh, I see. Well, actually, uh, I think if you talk about the, uh, the China's currency, RMB, we call it RMB, RMB. Uh, I think we are in the process of uh, uh, improving, our, improving our reform, reforming our foreign currency, uh, foreign exchange system. In my book, in, published in 1999, I proposed a three-step strategy. First step is packing to the dollar. Second strategy is packing to a basket. Third step is to make RB, RMB fully convertible. So by the year 2005, uh, July 2005, we already changed our foreign exchange policy to, from packing to a dollar to refer to a basket. And now we are going to the further step to make RMB fully convertible. But it takes some time. Uh, I think our current account has been liberated in the 1996.
but our capital account still, according to IMF, there are 43 sub-accounts in capital accounts. I think half of them are already liberated, so we still have several steps to go. But our final goal is to make RMB fully convertible. This is our final goal. And, but for RMB as a, if, as a universal currency, I think it takes much longer time. At uh, this, uh, I cannot uh, answer your question, but I would say it depends for of the, 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 the global situation not only depends on us. And on the other hand, we cannot compare the other country. We just on, should on a volunt voluntary basis say the 10 plus 1, you know, the Asian countries and China will have our free trade zone next year. So in this case, if those countries would like to use RMB, RMB as a clearance basis, we are welcome. But we cannot force them to use RMB as a clearance basis. If they want to use dollar, that's okay. Right. So I can answer your question on when. But as I, in my opinion, we have no intention to make RMB a universal currency in, to replace dollar or to replace euro. But we would like to increase the influence of RMB first the, maybe in the Asian, uh, in, the, in Asia, then in the world. Okay. And the second question, uh, Czech Republic have a presidency in European Union and speak about open a new Silk Road from Czech, Ukraine, Kazakhstan to China. And is problem 300 miles between Kazakhstan and Ukraine and go to or uh, Gruzia and Azerbaijan. Do you have a, something to establish a transportation corridor between Ukraine and Kazakhstan and transport goods from China to European Union? No? Actually, we, still, we already have some uh, good relationship with Kazakhstan, as you know. And also, you, you mentioned the Ukraine, right? Did you mention you meant the Ukraine? Yes. yes. Yeah, actually, the, actually, you know, historically, we have a relationship with those countries, those, those uh, uh, East Europe countries, I would say. And uh, actually, I think we still want to develop our trade relationship, relationship with them, uh, no matter under the European Union umbrella or uh, in, on a bilateral basis. But uh, as I said, this, I'm a scholar, just from a scholar's point of view. So the, okay. Uh, Professor Chen, I have a question relating to China's GDP in first quarter and uh, the relationship between GDP and the price of oil per barrel. I read an article very recently, which said China's GDP is a fishy because the oil price is so low. I think the connotation, the oil price was very low when uh, I think the range of oil uh, was $45 to 50 And that was the time when the article was published. And they said the Chinese official GDP is a fishy because the price of oil is so low. So do you have any comment on it? I think the connotation is that if China GDP really grow, really is that high, even if it's downward, you know, the consumption of oil in China should drive the price up. So I want to hear your uh, reaction to this article. Thank you so much. Well, actually, you know, I think the oil price has uh, has let, uh, less impact uh, on, on China's, uh, you mean China's uh, RMB's value or on? 
GDP. Out of GDP, oh, six point one. Yeah, I think it has less impact to China's GDP because our energy resources, seventy percent, is relying on coal. So pet petroleum is only part of maybe around twenty percent of our our uh, energy consumption. So. I don't think it's a big impact on China's GDP. It has some impact, but not very seriously, in my opinion. Do you have some suggestion for Chinese community here to oh. enter the Chinese market? You mean the, the Chinese community in, at UCLA? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, uh, in fact, I, I, I'm currently intern at the Ch 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 Chinese Chamber of C Commercial. I mean, Chinese community are doing business in U.S., such as Los Angeles area. Yeah, you mean not not at the UCLA, but the Chinese community in the United States, right? Yeah, yes, B because uh, you because you know many uh, United States uh, company has invested in China, but direct uh, investment from. Uh, Chinese com Chinese business in the United States is relatively limited. Yes, actually, I think the com Chinese community in the United States uh, contributed quite a lot to improve the relationship between the two countries, and because they they know China better, you know, because of the cu cu culture and the traditional reasons, they they understand they have more understanding about China than uh, the, the general Americans. And also, they have a little difficulty in communication. Right? So I think they contributed quite a lot to improve the relationship. I think, I wish in the future they will still contributed more to improve the relationship. Actually, in my opinion, we, can, we cannot only talk business. In China, we have a, a philosophy. It's if, if you want to, to do business, first you have to build friendship. You know, that's true. In my opinion, you know, the, the only through continuous contact between people, you can build up mutual understanding, mutual trust, and then you can have cooperation. So that means we need to build a friendship first. So the Chinese community can do this, can contribute quite a lot. Because the difference between Chinese uh, people and the Western people, there are many differences. I think, in my opinion, you know, some people are very friendly to China, but some people maybe have, it, ignorant about China. So they need to understand China. Some people may maybe have some misunderstanding about China. And some people maybe have some bias about China. So in this case, we need to develop mutual understanding. So I encourage all of you come to China and to see by your own eyes, because seeing is believing. Right? And the Chinese community here, I think, can have contributed more in developing mutual understanding between the American people and the Chinese people. And on the other hand, they can be a bridge to, to, you know, to promote the trade relationship. Uh, recently, I saw two different uh, scenarios. Uh, the first scenario is uh, the, the stock market in China recently, all the uh, new energy related you know, stocks, they are going skyrocketing, they are uh, rise very sharply. Um, at the same time, I saw another uh, statistics recently released uh, at, here in the U.S. that says that the first quarter of 2009, the venture capital investment into the new energy dropped almost 89% in the first quarter. So given that you are the uh, very influential in China's stock market, as well as you are the <laughs> father uh, of uh, China's uh, VC capital, uh, so. Uh, can we have your insight comment on these two different scenarios? Well, actually, we should look for a long range of view, not for a, for a slight uh, fluctuation in the short terms. I think in the short terms, the investors are 
influenced by some, you know, some uh, rumors, even by some, you know, other factors. So from a long-range point of view, China's policy is very clear. We will develop new energy and uh, to reduce the CO2 emission. Uh, as you know, our, uh, the, the total electricity, uh, installed electric, electricity capacity now is around, uh, I think it's around uh, 700 million kilowatts. And uh, by the year 2020, we will raise to uh, 1.2 trillion kilowatts. And, uh, but we want to produce more capacity, uh, to increase more capacity, not by coal fire uh, power plant. It's by wind, by wind power, by solar power, and by nuclear power. Nuclear, at this time being, our nuclear power is around uh, 6 million kilowatts. And by the year 2020, 2020 we will increase double to uh, 12 million. And uh, by the windmill power this, this year, we is around uh, uh, 10 million kilowatts. And uh, we would like by the year 2020, we would like to have 100 million kilowatts. And the solar power this year is 1 million, 1.5 million kilowatt. And we would like to raise it to 5 million kilowatt by the year 2020. So in this case, you can see by the year of 2020, the coal-fired plant will be, have a less, a small, have a less uh, importance than it is now. So this is uh, from a long range of view our policy. I cannot say uh, just in the stock market or venture capital, capitalists uh, in the short term, they may be, they, they have some other predictions. But from long, long range of view, I think this is a very clear picture for China. We have to develop new energy. We have to reduce our CO2 emission, not only for Chinese people, but for the, for the whole world. So that's my point. Thank you.